Shall I be buying Bitcoin, Willie? Yeah, you should. Of no, course you should. Bitcoin. Happy New Year, time. man. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, that's a bold statement. Are we, to start are this. we wait, wait, are we recording? That's not meant to We're go recording. Up. I don't I'm people, not a I'm not a freaking oracle. I never see people seen that. were you just said it. The bottom's in. I'm <laughs> holding you to it. This is going out, man. So what was the bottom? 33 K. Um yeah, that's something like that. It, it it depends on what um oh looking at this, yeah, thirty two point nine, yeah, yeah. That was the bottom um that we've had recently. Um, so, yeah, Arthur, that's... did you re- did you read uh, Arthur's Medium post? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I was sent uh, something he said in a in a in a channel somewhere, but I don't know if it was what was in his um, Medium channel. What was that? He said, "Have some dry powder ready." He said, "At some point, there will be the capitulation event, the point of ultimate pain, and that's when when you need to be ready to buy." Ah, yeah, yeah. That's I saw that someone forwarded it to me in some sort of chat channel he was in. Um, he's saying he could feel it. It's going to be like the final work down. Of course, he would know because um, you know with all those Bitmex times, um, which was largely responsible for those capitulation candles. Um, yeah, he would know. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think um, it's looking that bad right now. Nothing yeah. makes sense anymore, Louis. It's, uh, it's, you know, it keeps changing, right? <laughs> like, um, we're in a, in a, I think, a pretty crappy situation if you're um, like an old-timer Bitcoiner who's purist and, you know, it's about, um, you know, it's about freedom, liberty, cypherpunk. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's like now it's becoming very, very financialized. Uh, we've had the ETFs. You know, plural, multiple ETFs being released in the US, but they're not spot ETFs, they're, they're futures ETFs. So they're back onto the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, so the CMEs are already now getting huge volumes, and it's given these institutional um, traders a, a venue to, um, you know, trade on. Like if it's risk off, wow, it's great to sell down on Bitcoin because it's almost a leverage trade on risk off because it crashes when it's risk off. When it's risk on, it goes up, right? So, um, it's, and it's this kind of funny phase where, like, it, it kind of reminds me of twenty mid-2019 to late 2020 where, you remember we are like, it was trading, it sort of pumped to 14,000 very quickly from our bottoms of three to four. And and then it sort of went sideways. That's Bitcoin 2019. Yeah, 2019, it was like, it was just this euphoric sort of recovery from a 3,000 bottom, 3,500 bottom, and then um, in a very short, you know, run of things, um, I think that was that was highly manipulated short squeezing that got it up there. And then we had a plus token sort of scam, scam billions of dollars, and they were dumping all their ill-gotten gains onto the market. And so 100,000, 150,000 Bitcoins were being dumped, maybe more. Um, and so that marked the 14,000 top. And then we were in the sideways chop, chop, chop downwards from 14,000 to 10 to, you know, down to six and a half. And then it went up again. And then we got a little bit of euphoric and then COVID happened and it flipped down. And then um, we got into this, you know, the whole world changed with and everyone went, risk off for a while. Um, we looked at gold as a safe haven. Um, Bitcoin was being lambasted as a failed safe haven. And all it did was trade this correlation with equities. And, um, you know, and it, it was kind of like now, right? It's like in this trapped sideways band where it's just trading this correlation of risk on risk off from macro traders looking at traditional stocks. And, um, you know, back in 2019, to 2020, like if you looked on chain what the investors were doing, they were accumulating, but you just couldn't see any impact on price because the price was really dictated by um, traders on the futures exchanges. And now that we're much more dominant in um, futures trading, particularly from institutions um, on these regulated um, or the regulated exchange, um, the CME, um, with huge volumes now going through it. 
the price of Bitcoin is not like, um, it doesn't really f- reflect what hodlers are doing so much. Um, some sort of impact, but it's kind of like five times or more diluted from where we might have been maybe, you know, early part of last year where there was a lot of spot buying and that just would determine the price. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a weird phase right now and it, it's, it's um, the market's restructuring is what I say. Um, like the amount of um, sell-off we had from 69,000 to, what was that, 32.9K, like, Wow, there was like there was not much hodlers selling. I tell you, there was just risk off sell down from futures exchanges, and that those traders <clears throat> led the price. They were dumping their futures, their quarterly futures, and um, and eventually the the the, the hodlers started selling down, um, like so ever so slightly, and it was quite different from what happened in May. Um, in May you could kind of predict it, right? You could see the hodlers were starting to dump and those hodlers were a lot of those guys that were buying in, um, you know, new hedge funds, institutional money, family offices, they were buying in um, from that breakout from 20,000 all the way up to 50, 50 to 60,000. Like there was a huge amount of buying that was underlying the, um, you know, spot buying, taking those coins off the exchanges, putting into cold storage for long-term investment. And um, it seems like a lot of those guys sold off and dumped in May. Um, and you could see that coming, but here, very little people sold. It was a very gradual slide down on on-chain demand. And yet the price was sliding and kept sliding. And it was led by the futures, um, which was different from what we normally see, which is the, you know, the on-chain demand supply tends to lead um, the price action. Um, mm. So it's one of these weird times, you know, I'm kind of interested to see what, you know, what the structure sort of looks like and how the dynamics work between all the different participants now that we've got futures ETFs here. And um, Are you basically saying like the financialization of Bitcoin into the mainstream has essentially changed the, the structure of the market? Oh, yeah, totally. Like the way that the price is behaving right now is so different from where it was um, <clears throat> You know, in the first half of last year, um, and and yeah, it's it's changed so many times though. You know, this is like, I I feel like it's like you know coming out of the thirty thousand bottom that was like sort of June July, um, that rally was quite different um, from others, and I think that was a transition where, you know, in that rally upwards, that was when um, the spot, uh, sorry, the futures ETF started to go live. Um, so you know, this is just as my view on it, just seeing how the price is being impacted by um, <clears throat> in relation to what the futures are doing. Um, just looking at the two different movements and the, the, it's like the weighting's gone towards the futures a lot more now. Um, and the only th- difference that's, that I can account for it in between that time is um, the... The, the the ETFs that went live in between that that time, you know, from the last bottom to now, are those uh, futures ETFs bad bad then for Bitcoin? Yeah, I think so. Um, you do. We don't need them, right? You can buy Bitcoin retail can buy Bitcoin on Square Cash App, right? On on mm. Kraken, Gemini, Coinbase, you know, Binance, any 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 exchange you can buy it on. Um, there's no need for an ETF. The only interface into, um, you know, like the, the argument for ETFs is to, to um, <clears throat> it's easy access for, for um, effectively the stock traders, right? The, um, you know, and you might say that might be like the older generation, Gen Xs, the boomers that have, you know, they call up their brokers and, and whatnot. But in reality, I think um, it's, um, it's it's a very good instrument. This the futures ETF, um, if you're an institutional trader, because it's it's fully regulated. You can either trade the CME or you can trade the the equities. But if you're going to buy Bitcoin to hold, you'd be an idiot to buy the 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 ETF that's currently structured, right? Because it's so expensive to hold it. Um, mm. Just the way it's structured, you're paying um, what is it like? You might be losing fifteen percent per year by holding that um, 
because you're buying futures and futures is effectively um, holding Bitcoin by renting the house rather than buying the house. Would a spot ETF change that then? Yeah, it's a lot better. Like the rent you pay on that might be half a percent instead of like 15% um, per year. But would this spot ETF take volume away from the futures ETF because they've got an alternative and better product? Uh, I don't know if it would take much volume because it would attract the hodlers. You, you know, a spot ETF you would buy and you'd be comfortable holding that and paying your management fee of half a percent per year. Um, you know, like Grayscale, you pay, you pay a management fee of what? An eye gouging 2%, which is highly ridiculous. Um, given the size of that, that instrument. Um, but then if you're doing um, like a futures ETF instrument, you might be 10, it depends on how bullish the market is, it might be 10, 15, even 20. Sometimes it goes to 30% um, annualized to, to hold that. Um, and so um, it's, it's great if you're an institutional trader that's in for a three-day trade or a one-hour trade or a five-minute trade because you don't care about the rent um, at that point. But um, if you're hodling, that's critical. Um, you know, Bitcoin's got to now appreciate at, you know, 10 20% per year just so that you break even um, versus holding Bitcoin through an ETF versus holding Bitcoin under cold storage yourself, right? So, mm. um, so I mean... Yeah, like, like it's the most expensive is a futures ETF. The next would be a spot ETF. Um, the next would be buying the underlying Bitcoin under a custodian solution. They might charge 20 bips, like 0.2% per year to hold it for you. And then finally, you, you can take the private keys under your own hands, which doesn't cost you anything. Um, yeah, so really big question, man. <laughs> Could we be going into a bear market? Could we be in a bear market? Uh, not um, if the pass repeats, right? Every time we've seen long-term holders um, holding most of the coins, um, you know, it's it's structurally set up for it to run upwards. Um, bear markets happen when everyone who's holding the coins are noobs. Um, and when you say, like, long-term versus noobs, it's basically how long are those, those coins being um, aged in a wallet. So if you look across all the wallets on <clears throat> on the on the blockchain and and you go look let's what's how old are these coins before they move how long have they been sitting in these wallets you know it goes through cycles and these tight cycles where um, you know most of the coins have been sitting there for more than five months um, it's a very strong setup which is what we've got now it's at peak levels of um, these coins. The coins across um, all of the the network have been sitting there, most of them, for more than um, five months. And people who do that, they've held on for five months. They're not selling. Mm. They're not selling at a loss. They will sell when there's profit be had. And you'll see that whenever it breaks out of like all-time highs and does a really strong rally, those guys that have been holding for five months start to take the money and they, they take cash um, that's available. You know, they cash out, they take the profit. And... Eventually, um, new guys that are coming in to buy the um, buy the rally, they're the new guys, and you know they want to get rich too. They're the bag holders, and they're the well, you know, they're the bag holders. But what they what typically happens is um, it's very vulnerable to a, a bear market because some of them sell, right? They sell. Mm. Um, like the twenty eighteen bear was at peak new guys holding the coins, and you the cycle repeats. Those new guys either sell or the ones that don't become hardened hodlers and they sell on the next rally when it goes even higher. So it's just like old hands um, are out, new hands become old hands and it's just back and forth. And we're in the old hand situation. We went rallying from 30,000 to um, 69 and we did see a little bit of sell down from those five month old, old holders and they took some profit. And then as it sort of crashed down, like, no, let's say slide, it wasn't a crash, it was slid down, slid down. They, you know, lo and behold, around about 40,000, um, low 40s, they just stopped selling. Um, we, they've stopped selling for actually a number of weeks now. And actually they're, they're now like, you could say they're accumulating or in other words, 
some of the new guys have sort of aged to the five month zone and they're becoming old hands. So those guys, um, as an equilibrium, that cohort is now gaining. And so it's actually strengthening again. So it's not a, um, you know, structurally on chain, it's not a bear market setup, even though I would say we're at peak fear, like no doubt about it, people are really scared, um, which typically is a time to like, you know, like it's an opportunity to buy. Um, and like, you don't often get this kind of pullback um, without it like relief bouncing even. Um, you know, it's not, you don't sort of slide, slide, slide and then, and then capitulate um, with, you know, we've come, we've come down from um, 60, 69 to 33 and it'd be hard pressed to capitulate from 33 down to say 20 because that's like um, retracing something like a 2018 bear market over two, two, two and a half months instead of a year, right? Mm. Um, so anyway, like structurally, it's very, very strong and demand started to come back in. Um, the hodlers that were slightly being um, dis dispirited by the, the futures traders selling down have, have um, stopped selling. They're rebounding now and there's accumulation coming. The whales are now, um, and when I say whales, these are guys with more than 1,000 Bitcoins. So, so I term a lot of those guys as potentially institutional um, investors. They're, they're starting to um, flick over to buying, right? They, they, they peaked their selling in December. So you could say institutions were selling down in December, which is kind of a part of their normal cycle. They sell down, they redeploy in January. Looks like that started. Um, the whales are coming in. Um, the futures, um, you know, coming off the CME and ETF and, you know, all the other um, futures exchanges. But I primarily think that the CME <coughs> and this futures ETF drives a lot of this now. Um, that demand started to come in. It started to come in a few days ago. Mm. So, um, yeah, like most of this week, demand started to come in and... For weeks on end, it was just toxic. It was just no demand. It was like um, divestment, divestment, divestment. Um, so, like, yeah, it's it seems pretty um, cheap right now. Um, Takes me back to the uh, the downhill super cycle thing. We talked about that last time. And one of the things you talked about is that, you know, one of the things that might be is that cycles are lengthening. So rather than having... You know, what we expected was a run up at the end of the year, cash out in January, pay the taxes, and then uh, a bear market uh, for the next two and a half years and go again. It feels like this whole cycle could be one that's lengthening and perhaps it's, you know, the, the bull market itself, which is normally about a year, is perhaps maybe two, two and a half years and then a longer bear market afterwards. You know, I don't know what the super cycle means. I haven't actually read his article. Someone told me I have got the wrong idea about the super cycle. It is actually based on price. Is it based on price? Something like that. We go. Well, he said the super cycle would would be if we didn't. I think didn't drop below fifty percent on the drawdown, which is you know ish, uh, and you know we immediately rallied. It was something around like that. But okay. last time I spoke to him, he said really what he's looking at is he thinks perhaps it's that the cycles are lengthening. Which kind of makes sense because if we don't do an eighty percent, you know, we've had a fifty odd percent drawdown. If we don't go to eighty percent drawdown, then that kind of makes sense because if we're not going to go down, you know, if it's whether it's sideways or up, it is a lengthening cycle. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I've said that this is the last cycle, which is the end of the four year cyclical um, thing that we're used to based on the halving, um, and now we're in for shortened cycles. Just to be contrarian. Um, well, we had a cycle starting May, um, and that was a run down, and we had another cycle that started in sort of, what was it? It was like uh, November as we sold down through December into January. Um, so six-month cycles. <laughs> but that's it. Like um, that's the, the, the last cycle is ran, like kind of random warps of demand and supply upwards um, to the final price discovery. Um, so I don't like think that will I don't think the yeah. last cycle, <laughs> the life cycle, right? Yeah, the last cycle. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just basic um, demand supply dynamics between all the 
the industry right now is much more complex and it's not governed by just the miners who were the only supply side. Um, you know, you've got a lot of supply side. The, the futures ETF is supply side. Like you're holding the ETF while you're paying rent and that's, that's, that's earned by the landlord of the ETF and that's being dumped on the market, that supply side. Grayscale, you know, Barry Silbert, he's supply side and makes 2% on that 650,000 Bitcoins sitting in his ETF. Um, there's a lot of supply side that sort of um, is uh, more than um, more than um, making up for what the, the miners um, used to do. And, the, and then the miners are now less supply side, you know, they're like some of them now becoming public companies and they don't sell because that's the whole point that they, they, they're, um, their investors are effectively investing in them for their Bitcoin holdings as they mine it for cheaper than buying it off the exchanges. So, um, yeah, it's, it's changing. Um, so, yeah, no more four-year cycles. And also it means, you know, we, we're experiencing up to 60% drawdowns, um, but at least that's over two to three months instead of a year or you know what? Well, uh, you know, I, I, my first bear market was the twenty fourteen bear market, and that was the longest in Bitcoin's history. You know, that was like nuclear winter. It was so, it's so long for that to be over. Um, so, um, yeah, two to three months. It's pretty. It's pretty good. Is it making making your job? Must be making your job a lot harder then. Yeah, it, it is, right? Like, well, I do on-chain pr predominantly, but really I have really now have to just do much more work on um, what's happening on derivative markets. Um, and that, that's starting to, that's, that's always been good for short term and, you know, breeding when these crazy wicks are going to happen. And, uh, but now, like, what we've just seen is a very long-term move that's been two and a half months that was driven by derivatives coming from, you know, like these longer term swing traders, which I think are institutional, um, you know, buying these these quarterly contracts that expire in six months. And the yeah, it's it's definitely <clears throat> a different dynamic. Um, lot you can't just be blind and just blind to like um, the derivative markets and all the other parts of the ecosystem. Um, you know, options, and that's another area as well. So um, it, it's just you've got to take into account all of it. Now it's so macro-focused, so there's more of that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot more tricky. But this is what you expect when a market matures. Um, um, it's like, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's like very difficult to get an edge on, say, an equity market where it's matured over 100 and something years, maybe 200 years. Um, like, like I was just talking to a, like a traditional TradFi quant firm and, you know, like we were all talking last year about this time about the cash and carry trade. I remember Plan B was talking about it, how you can get a good 15, 20, 25% yield off Bitcoin. But if you buy Bitcoin, you can get that amount of yield from it. Even if you don't want Bitcoin, you can buy it, you sell the futures and you can get that yield on USD. Um, and like that trade doesn't work in traditional markets. It's it's like it's been it's been pushed down to nothingness, and like that's happening in Bitcoin too, right? We we used to get some pretty phenomenal yields. Um, like some some of the really good quant firms were doing maybe um, getting up to eighty to one hundred percent annualized. Um, over the first half of um, last year, and since say mid mid midway through this year, that stuff's collapsed down to maybe forty percent. Um, so it's halved, and you can see the correlations between a lot of different instruments getting tighter as their inefficiency being inefficiency is being sucked out of the market. So I think that that trade, which everyone was excited about, um, I mean Preston Pish was saying, yeah, that's like a that's going to be a really big um, sort of black hole to drive capital in. I mean, that that kind of stuff is starting to, you know, um, get more and more efficient. Eventually, it'll be 
not worth doing. Um, it'll be very, only the best people can make money off that. Mixi, uh, super tricky for new people coming in. And I, I think even more so than ever, it's like, if you're coming in now, don't try and be a trader in this because it's a tricky market to trade. It's I think there's more evidence now for new people coming into DCN, HODL, and just like, ride this out. You know, but my advice, Willie, is always like, listen, every every Bitcoin you buy or all the sets you buy, you should be thinking about holding them for a minimum of four years and not thinking about the price because it's so easy now to come in and the price drop or the price go up and have no idea where we're going. And yeah, even that statement, it's like it was based on an old dynamic where we were a four year yeah. cycle, you'd be in the bull again. Whereas that, I don't think that holds true anymore. But yeah, certainly long term is the way because if you're holding, you're immune to being squeezed out of the trade. Um, but, you know, like this is one of the, I mean, this is a Bitcoin channel. Um, and of course, we hate old coins, but like, um, you don't hate channel, old coins. I don't, but I'm saying this channel is generally. Um, the the thing is with altcoins is that they're very easy to trade <laughs> because they're not efficient, right? And so they they obey technicals very very well. Um, and once it's rallying, it, those things can go to the moon because there's no real um, well developed futures market take the heat out of the market. So they'll go fully exponential and they'll fully collapse like Bitcoin used to do before futures um, futures instruments. So. And then if you're an NFT trader, well, hell, it's like going back uh, maybe like seven years in trading Bitcoin <laughs> because it's just like to the moon, right? So there's always new instruments. And I see a lot of the Gen Zs and the younger crew with um, somewhat le maybe less capital. Um, if you want to like trade and do all that stuff, certainly um, these, these altcoin markets are a good way to learn like you know, I used to like, when I was learning to trade on crypto, it was like, it was Poloniex was the day, right? And they had all these markets, maybe 100, 120 markets. And right at the top was the Bitcoin um, USD pair, USDT pair, pair. And then below that, there was the um, Ethereum Bitcoin pair, I think. Um, yeah, it was like, and then below that was some big cap, but it would go all the way down to ranked 120 to some tiny little shit coin. And, um, and you could just, it's, the whole thing was a casino, right? The, the big league was uh, ETH BTC, right? That was sophisticated trading. And then you could go all the way down to the little shit coin, penny, penny coin type um, um, table and trade that. And you just know that like the big sharks aren't gonna be bothered to try and win you know, a tiny a bit of capital on that because it's not liquid enough. There's not enough money at stake. So um, I think that still holds true now with like the like 8,000 altcoin markets. We no, was it? I don't know what it is. What does CoinGecko have? <laughs> it's like, is it must be 10,000. I'm on coin market cap now. Solano's had a, Solano's been savaged from its uh, yeah. upper point. What's quite interesting is in, in comparing the charts of these uh, shit coins to Bitcoin, it's like um, they seem to... Like they they seem to have had just like one big spike, and then they're coming back down. They kind of looks very similar to, like you say, what Bitcoin used to be. Whereas Bitcoin's kind of gone, it went up, then it came down, then it went slightly higher, and it's come down again. But there's not like a complete correlation between them. But Solano's down to what eighty ninety three dollars from a top of what like two fifty. Man, if you go up that, like from $2 to $250 in one year, yeah, you're going to, if you're going to get like more than 100x in one year, you've got to expect, um, get, you know, that's not that big a retrace after you've done 100x, right? But it, for the individual, it depends when they get in. It's okay for the people who get in at $2. Yeah, well, like, you know, Bitcoin was like that in 20, um, 2012, 2011. Um, do you remember the, the double pump and then it came back to, in the like it was, well, even what, $1,200 to 150 um, And then it did a 100 and, um, 130X or something like that from 2015 to 2017. So like Bitcoin's no different, but now it's very different, right? Because the difference between a, a, a shitcoin, like a tiny little shitcoin market and, um, 
and like Bitcoin, is that is effectively the ability for a trader to sell what they haven't got today um, from the future, from these futures markets. So as it's rallying, I will, I can sell it. I can sell it. Um, and um, and so when you can't sell it, then there's no demand and supply. It's just demand with no one really wanting to sell. And the thing goes exponential and you get this parabolic. Um, like, like um, you know, I see parabolic Trav, who was well known back in that era to really call these parabolic curves, but it's pretty difficult now because mm. Bitcoin doesn't do parabolics, it does straight lines. Um, it's it was a, these fundamental, um, you know, new instruments have come in to, you know, impact the demand and supply. So, uh, yeah, we were, it's a different era. But if you're trading these little tiny low cap coins, um, it, it's kind of like the early days of Bitcoin. Um, not recommending like, oh, actually, I like if you want to really know how markets work, put a few bucks on the line and learn how to learn how these markets work. Um, Trading is actually a good experience. Just don't put big money in there because you're going to lose um, unless you're really good. Doggy coin looks rough, man. That peaked at, where was it? May the 7th at like, looked like it hit about 70 cents and it's down to like 13 it looks like it's um the elon musk thing is not um but you know i'm looking at on a log chart across um maybe eight years and it's not doing too bad it's a it looks like ethereum you know it's like gosh when i got into bitcoin like um well yeah it was like when it was worth um you know, 0.04 of a penny, and now it's worth 14 pennies or something like that. So Yeah, but if they got it's like, again, it depends when you get in. I know. It's like if you got in on the, like, on the Elon Musk shilling, then you would have been wrecked. Um, but I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's an interesting thing. Is like I, I think that, like, you know, if you were to talk to family offices, you know, they may ma- and manage $100 million of, you know, high net worth family and, f- and friends money. Um, you ask them what they're invested in, they'll say Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of them will say a Solana. Um, they might, um, you know, quote, you know, Avalanche. They might quote some of the top 20 coins. And um, that tells me that um, Plan B stock to flow uh, model isn't capturing the full situation. It's a very maximalist view on um, like Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency to get exposure to a digital scarcity. And when in fact um, Ethereum came along and then now in this this kind of bull market since um, 2021, um, you know, you've got Solana that's come in, um, Cardano's really taken a lot, um, Polkadot, Avalanche, all these other coins. And um, the people with money are deploying into it where they would have just bought Bitcoin when it was just Bitcoin. So if you look at the stock to flow cross model, right, and what that is, is um, along the um, X axis is um, how scarce it is. So he he measures that by um, stock to flow, effectively the inflation rate, how much new supply is coming in, like for real estate, how many new buildings are being built, um, for gold, how much are we mining at silver, same. And then you look at the total market cap on the vertical. And lo and behold, his, his cross model shows Bitcoin early stage and each halvening, it's sitting on this trend line in this silver. And then there's gold, and I believe there's real estate, and he's put diamonds in there. And it's just a straight line upwards going, okay, and that's why this is going to be the price of Bitcoin. Um, but actually, the last two clusters for Bitcoin um, post the 20, I think, what was it, 2015 halvening, it started to deviate downwards. So did it, the, the, the latest halvening we had in 2019. Um, it's even further deviated down. What happened in 2015? Ethereum came out, the first um, cryptocurrency that actually um, 
got a lot of liquidity and a lot of people did deploy money into it and it was competing against Bitcoin. So money did come out of the Bitcoin um, bucket into the Ethereum bucket or another way you could say it is the bucket is not Bitcoin or Ethereum. The bucket is called crypto assets, crypto properties, online you know, digital property and now it's being split. So we suddenly had new flow coming in. Ethereum came in and increased the inflation rate of the entire bucket. And then now in 2019, we've had much bigger cap coins that have come in to compete. And you can see that deviation coming downwards. So I think stock to flow works. I just think that it's too maximalist in a viewpoint and that um, there are hedge funds and family offices and individuals that are deploying into this stuff and um, the vertical is not Bitcoin. It, it's crypto assets as a whole bucket. And I think if you correct for that, I think it will be on the, that trend line. Um, some, it's pretty hard to figure out what the flow is when they're not the same thing. You know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're, they're like, or Solana, they're different things. So how do you judge the flow? But um, I think if you can do that, it would be right on the stock to flow trend line. Have you dabbled in the NFT stuff? No, not really. I, I, um, I think I'm getting too tired. <laughs> it's, too, it's like it's just full on, just working on Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's it's uh, yeah. So it, it, I, I have you. <laughs> have you looked into it? Have you played with no, it? No, um, because. I have no interest in owning an NFT, right? There's, I'm just, I don't care for it. I don't hate it. You know, people, I think people should do what they want. I have no interest in owning one. I don't have a desire to say I have this uh, bored cat or crazy don- donkey or whatever it is that people are buying. I just I have no desire. Um, but also, therefore, and I also have no interest in figuring out how to trade them. So, like, I've got no interest in them at all. I I can see like some potential value in, you know, like if it was a ticket, but then, then can't you just do the same with a QR code? And I, like, I do understand that maybe like for certain musicians, like if you had the NFT and it gave you like some benefits, like I can see that, but like, I'm like, are we just, are we trying to find a, sol- a problem for a solution? And so I just, and, and typically with any of these crypto things, whether it's NFTs or ICOs, suddenly it just like sweeps across both the crypto community and wider culture and just becomes a thing. And I was in uh, Miami during Art Basel and it was just fucking NFT stuff everywhere. And I just, I just wanted to get away from it. So like, I don't hate it. I just have no interest in it. But my thing I worry about for people who... Um, who are buying these is just as an investment because not that they want to own it. Um, the one problem I think they've got, you don't have a market sell button. Like even with the shit is a shit coins, you can usually market sell and get out of the trade. As I see it with an NFT, there has to be a buyer, right? There's no market sell. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it, I, I don't know. It's like, um, I think it's got merit because we have an art world and people still value an art. Mm. Um, and um, I think it's showing that people do recognize that a claim or ownership on something that's even digital, just say I'm the special person that has the only person that has brownie points because I have the claim on that, even though it's, you know, anyone can enjoy it um, at the same quality, you know. It's 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 pro it's proven that there's value in it. I mean, there was a experiment run. I forget the name of the artist, but he did a run of real art, and then <clears throat> he 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 issued he issued an NFT for each one of them, and so you could buy. Is that Beeple? I don't know if it was Beeple. I but he did a run. He was a well-known, established artist. And you could either have the the physical or you could have the NFT. If the NFT was wanted, then the artwork would be destroyed. Um, And you get the NFT, vice versa, the NFT is burnt, and then you get the artwork. And it was interesting because not everyone wanted the artwork. It was significantly people wanted the NFT. Mm. So it was like there's an experiment that shows that uh, they've, 
it's proven now that that's a thing, right? Um, so, um, uh, but I don't understand. I don't know how to trade it. And I'm like, well, I don't want to learn how to trade it right now. I'm too busy. And like, I remember the learning curve of Bitcoin going down that rabbit hole. It's just like, I guess if I had nothing else to do. That would be a fun um, rabbit hole to go down, right? Um, especially if I had a few bucks and I wanted to make hundreds or thousands or millions. And I see the temptation, Willie, like I've got a football club now. I've got a squad of players. Can people buy the NFT of the players and like own the players NFT? And I, 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 I'm not going to do it. They're like the cons- consideration didn't even exist, but like in my head, I was trying to work through, well, why would you? And I can see why people do it. Cause it's a chance to, I think exploit people to make money. And I and I expect this to happen through other football clubs. I expect it to happen with artists. They're not going away. I just imagine that it's going to be a, like a massive oversupply of these things. And we're going to get down the road, maybe four years down the line, the majority are going to be worth nothing. And there's going to be like, and maybe that's like the traditional art world. There's going to be a few big players who've done very well, like the Beeple. And I'm sure if like some other big mm-hmm. artists did it, but... I can imagine it's like 99.9% of all the value created will go to 1% of the artists or something, and the rest will just yeah. be like this long kind of line of useless, worthless shit. Yeah, I mean, that's a standard. Like, they happened with the internet too, right? Um, mm. The NASDAQ took, oh, when it when the bubble burst in like ninety nine was it was it two thousand and one I forget but ninety nine it took till it was was a it was like a dozen years before it came back again and this is after the iPhone was invented everyone was on Twitter and Facebook our whole mobile lives revolved around the internet our whole lives revolved around the internet and it took twelve years for all that to be built um, before the real internet that was invasive into every nook and cranny of civilization in people's lives. Um, you know, and I was like valued at that in the few, in 12 years earlier when it was just, you know, coupled together um, home pages practically and like geo cities. So geo city. Yeah, I could see, I could see this, you know, um, you know, like when Yahoo was like, you know, two guys out of a caravan, like, creating a web page that listed <laughs> all the known web pages they'd heard of. <laughs> I mean, then that was when millions of dollars being poured in, the thing was valued at. Um, you mentioned that. You know, close to like the NASDAQ, you know, <laughs> you know, decades later. And so, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's what we're looking at, right? <laughs> Imagine that in your garage with your mate and it's like, oh, this new internet thing's cool. Let's create a list of all the pages we like. What should we call it? Let's call it Yahoo. Right, we're billionaires. <laughs> What the fuck? Yeah, no, it's like someone knocks on the caravan and says, so we want to give you a million dollars because we think there's a thing in this. And then that became Yahoo. Um, <laughs> and then all the finance guys said, how do we value this shit? You know, it was like, yeah. how do you value something like this? Um, I mean, I don't think, look, like I, the ICO kind of died, right? It's not a thing anymore. It's a it's a poisoned word in some ways. And I know there's like similar things, and but the ICO is kind of like a poison word. It died. But I don't think NFTs will die I just think the problem, the main problem I have with it, Willie, is like right now is a lot of this stuff, for those who don't understand the whole nature of the crypto industry, it all gets lumped in together. So if you're a Bitcoiner or you're an NFT person, you get lumped into the same, you know, get into the same bucket. I've had it with the people who are looking at my football club and they're like, they're they think I'm the same as the the people who try to buy a team by selling NFTs or the fan token people. I'm like, no, we're not. I care about sound money. <laughs> you don't have to buy anything. We're not selling anything. You're not selling any token. We're not, you know. And sadly, we get lumped in it together. And they're like, I see them as two different things. And that whole Bitcoin not blockchain and that Bitcoin not crypto thing, it really stands out now. Oh, yeah, you can use, well, that's, I don't know. It's the, the whole the whole ecosystem is so diverse now. Um, mm. You know, you 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 could be in any. You know, I don't know. These must be like thousands of Telegram groups, all bef- before each coin for one for each coin, and the culture behind each one is co- totally different. You know, you have the scientific guys, you have the pump and dump guys, you have the. You know, I mean, he's he's 
it's all sorts. It's all sorts. Every community is different. But the Maxi Bitcoin community is different from the Ethereum community too. So yeah, it's it's um yeah. I mean, I don't know what to say with that, but yeah, I see it. Um, and but you know, like look, I've got it in front of me now. These twelve thousand nine hundred coins, nine hundred thirteen coins on Coin Gecko. What's the last one? Oh, well, there's, there's, there'll be a plural because a lot of them probably don't have a market price or something. And you can usually find something for any word you can think of. Pick, think of an animal. Pick any animal. Let's see if it exists. Um, a tuatara. Oh, fuck off, Louis. <laughs> Louis? There you go. Fuck nah, off, didn't get there. There you go. Yeah, Someone go out some... there can do a tuatara coin. Let's go um, with so many cat coins there are. Cat token, <laughs> cat, terra cat. <laughs> Right. There's a lot of doggy um, ones. What was the uh what was the what was the uh the animal that was meant to have um started the the Wuhan virus because it kissed a bat? Was it a bat? I thought it was a bat. Is it a pangolin? Is it a pangolin? What the right, hell? This, yeah, it was a pangolin. Okay. There's definitely a PNG coin. Pangolin. Let's see if there's a there's pangolin. a lot of pangolins. There there's, is a, there there's, is pang- a pang- there's two of them. There's a pangolin <laughs> um pangolin swap. Right and PNG, which is pangolin. So I imagine they're they're very related. Let's see, let's see if there's a coronavirus. Oh, these do- definitely. There must be like COVID coin. So uh, meme coins, you know. Um, but this is why it's become so fucking yeah. COVID token, COVID slice. This is why it's so fucking meaningless because like you can have a coin for everything, but it's like they don't do shit. They don't do shit. Elon, your stupid fucking doggy coin. You didn't help us. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's. I mean, he's such a smart guy, but he doesn't really get crypto. He doesn't well, get crypto. I think he likes to troll, and then I think he got. He didn't realize what he was doing, and then it was like double down with doggy coin, double down, double down. No, when you look at like um, some of the deeper comments, who were saying like we can use layer two, um, uh, like he just didn't get decentralization. What what the vulnerabilities of when you put things on layer two is? Um, is you know he was also talking about you just increase the block size without even considering. I think Adam Beck corrected him. You know there are speed of light considerations which mean um, you can't have the blocks too big, you can't have the block time shorter. Um, before th- there's only a Goldilocks zone where the whole thing falls over if you're outside of that zone, and he just didn't know all the stuff and. Um, and so, you know, if he's kind of a guy that reads a stack of books on rockets and figures out how to build a rocket. And I don't think he's done the time to, um, figure out how all this stuff works. Yeah. I think it's Marty Bennett says that you've got to do the work and he's not done the work, but, but he also think at the same time it was part doubling down, like to turn around and admit, yeah, I, uh, I was totally wrong about doggy coin and everyone, I, every lemming I left. I led off the off the ledge. I, I was wrong about. It. I'm very sorry. It's just did he actually he say that to do that? No, no, that's me. Say that? Like no. saying no, it's right. me saying what he should say, but I can't see him doing that. Right. Oh, that would crash the price. <laughs> yeah, that would. Um, it would be over. Yeah. It'd be over. Be over. So, anyway, like the rest of the year, man. Man, ma'am, what are you thinking? Like, where's Willie's head at? Where's your head at? What market wise? Or? Yeah, like <laughs> how are you playing this, man? This is the listeners are gonna be like, Willie, what am I doing, man? Am I smash buying? Well, the, I mean, I have a lot of people that ask me, what's my plan for the top of the bull market? Because they're used to nuclear winters, right? Four year cycles, and um, like my plan is always an operation, which is to take take um, money to cash um, consistently. So I have a because I don't believe in um, bull bear four year cycles and nuclear winters. I think we're just doing more of the same. We're, this is the second time we've gone up and we've retraced more than 50%. And then we're going up and they're just choppy. It's just choppy times. And so you don't want to be overexposed. You don't want to be all in. You don't want to be all in and then on leverage because when it pulls back 50%, you're going to be freaking out. And um, the, there's a thing about freaking out is um, the most tragic thing about freaking out is not the pain of freaking out, but the loss of your IQ. <laughs> when when you're freaking out, you don't think straight and you do the stupidest things like sell the absolute bottom because now you've got to um, cover 
the pain you're under and not in the sleepless nights because you were overexposed. So, um, so really, um, it's always like, I've always got a chunk in cash, even though Maxi's, you know, like us, I'm also could, could consider myself a Maxi when I talk about Bitcoin as a, a monetary standard, but us Maxis like to think all in and never hold that duty sinking fiat. But I'm like, I'm just practical. It's like, I, I, I'm going to have this, percent, I think it's like, well, my minimum is always have 10% in cash. Um, and that 10% in cash, I know that like, uh, that's self-preservation of my um, ability to think. <laughs> right. So I, uh, that's my strategy is, is to have between 10 to 20. I probably want to ramp it even um, 20 to 30%, um, maybe even 40% in cash as we go into this year. Um, but I, I would say that, um, it's because like cash, you can, we can currently yield on cash and we can, we can beat the monetary dilution that the Fed's printing. Um, so like I'm looking for high yield on USD and honestly, that's better than real estate, <laughs> um, real estate growth. Uh, so my thing is now to go like two liquid buckets. One is, um, you know, crypto, Bitcoin, predominantly, um, actually, I, the only thing I hold is Bitcoin. Um, and then I have stable coins that are yielding. And then I have speculative, the speculative thing called a exchange account, which holds any number of shit coins and trades or leverage instruments. Um, and that's my exposure to the exotic stuff, including altcoins. My, if I ever buy Ethereum, I'm only buying it on the exchange. Um, Maybe that's maybe that's wrong. You're not cold storage at it. I never cold storage uh, unless it's like um, I'm playing DeFi. You know, then you have to use, you know, that, that Ethereum network's going to, you know, take me to the cleaners every time I <laughs> click some MetaMask wallet. It's you know, it's like you know, to your own, it's like two hundred dollars per per transaction doing some weird thing <laughs> like oh sorry, some very interesting, innovative um, smart contract. No, 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 I mean it too. It's like, it's cool experiments, but God, it's, <laughs> you got to be trading like a lot of money before you, that gas fee is worth it compared to like doing something on the exchanges. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's how I, I'm playing it. I'm putting more into cash sort of, um, cause I don't see us like being so cyclical and so easy to read these cycles. Like, um, who read the top? Who read 69,000 said we're going to go to 32.9 um, in no, the next few months? We were Nobody, going to 100, right? dude. We were going to 100. I think it even surprised institutions who were responsible for the initial sell-off, but then the whole thing went risk off even more, and then the people that were ready to step back in waited and like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> right. So, yeah, like I think just it's like uh, it's not. I'm not timing it as much, um, even though I time it in the exotic exchange basket. Um, I'm I'm just like, yeah, up the cash, sit on yield, um, and let's be honest, like Bitcoin's not um, like doing a 2015 to 2017 ever again. That was 133x. Like the only way it's going to do that is the Armageddon, financial Armageddon, um, where you don't even care what the US dollar is worth because it's it's hyperinflated away. And I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm like, I'm thinking longer term, like here's my cash exposure, here's my, you know, investments in companies, um, here's my house, here's Bitcoin, here's cash yield, and it's just sensible allocations. Sensible for me, it's probably a bit risk on for most people. Um, I'm well overexposed to tech and and um, and, and Bitcoin, um, but it's it's um, at least it's not 100% Bitcoin, um, and I do want to go more um, more uh, sort of balanced. So yeah, that's that's how I see it. Like if like I looked at the stock to flow uh, model. In the next four years, if it plays out and we're underperforming it, and I don't think it's going to hold. Um, because of this new flow coming in, that's about 100%, 110% annualized. And if you're in cash yield, you can get from 20 to 50% annualized. 
So US dollars got its place because if you're in cash yield, what's your maximum drawdown in any one month? It's positive. It's never a drawdown unless you get like, unless your instrument is highly exotic and it breaks down, like um, you're yielding off a DeFi network that's like on Ethereum that just got, completely got hacked or something. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, like it's, we're coming to a point where Bitcoin's growth going from a $1 trillion asset class into $10 trillion, um, the rate at which it's going to go, um, if you're into exotic investments, which, you know, Bitcoin's kind of still in that, that basket, you can still, you can now sort of look into early stage VC, um, early stage seed and VC baskets that can can reach that kind of performance. Um yeah, back in the, you know, you see how the success of um, Coinbase floating for over $100 billion. That um, was an investment, was it in 2011, 2012, uh, 2012 or something? The guys that invested in Coinbase um, did not outperform Bitcoin. Like, they would have got twice as much money if they just held their Bitcoin. And that was the most successful um, float we've seen so far of a a Bitcoin based or a crypto based company. And um, so it was always about just stay it, keep it in Bitcoin. But now we're in this phase where 110% annualized in an exotic instrument, you could do that from um, VC um, if you get the right bet. And um, so, yeah, it's an interesting time. I, I don't think we're in that era now where we, how we thought about it in 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, where this thing, when it goes, it's it's life changing money. Um, it's just a very sensible um, investment. That's high volatility. It's high gain, and it certainly should be a part of um, most people's investment portfolio just to balance out the other things. Um, but it's not a, a go to the moon vehicle. Like one dollar turns into uh, a million. Um, like well, those days are over for Bitcoin. Uh, maybe if you got a, a, a punk and minted it for free, and now it's multiple millions, you know, that's your vehicle for that. Um, and I think the kids know that, right? Like um, the young ones are, are trading these things and they're really getting into it. Um, and I think, good on them. Like, why not? Like, um, that stuff is there. Oh, I'm not any clearer than when I started. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> Who knows, man? I'm just going to keep stacking yeah. sats, Louis. Lou, I keep calling yeah. you Louis. Do you know why do I keep calling you Louis this week? I have no oh, idea. No. I have no idea. Have you slept enough? <laughs> oh, really? Football I team. It takes a lot of time. Dude, <laughs> literally, honestly, you think about it. I'm already was already busy enough with the fucking podcast, and now I'm doing this. It's keeping me busy. I know. But uh, you seen the shirts? No, I have not. Oh, maybe I have. Maybe I have. Show me. What is it? Like you got one on? Sup? No, no. Sup? Ah, one second. I get it. Okay. I can't show you the whole shirt though because like I can't reveal certain things on it. But like, this is the home shirt. Oh, the sponsors! You can't. Uh, oh, the. Eagles. No, this is the, sorry. That's the training shirt. This is the away shirt. Nice. This is the, this is the, the home shirt. But like something cool. Is, check is this it... out. On the back of each one, check this out. Oh, the Running orange. Running Bitcoin. Running Bitcoin. There you go. Satoshi. Are, are the players and, being paid in, in Bitcoin, by the way? That makes me think. It was like, no, they, no, is that no, the no. part of the thing? Well, they don't have to be. It's like totally optional. But one guy who's uh, I'm signing today, actually, he's a Bitcoin guy. He works over at Spiral, plays football. Uh, when I announce him, he he says he wants to be paid in Bitcoin. So, of course, he can be and he will be. That's awesome. Uh, but we, we retired the 21 shirt today for Satoshi. Oh, <laughs> okay. Who's that going to be? <laughs> Nobody's ever wearing the twenty-one shirt, dude. So, <laughs> so listen. Am I going to see you? Am I going to see you this year? Am I going to get to hang around in person? Yeah, I'm going to get. I'm going to travel. It's going to go to. I think we're already starting to plan to go to Europe at least, maybe the US. Um, it's time to get moving. So yeah, man. Yeah. Well, let me know because I want to hang out. I want to do a show in person. That would be good. I'll let you know when I'm in the neighborhood. All right, man. Well, listen, smash by, as you said. Keep stacking. Have some dry powder. Figure it all out, man. 
I never said smash by, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, well, listen, have a good but, month, uh, Louis. Always good to talk to you, dude. And hopefully in the next, few, <laughs> next few months, I'm going to see you. Okay, Bob McCormack. <laughs> we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs> see you there, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.